Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 321, I chat with acoustician Marshall Long about some of the basics of sound and acoustics. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, episode 321, Sound and Acoustics 101. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Epson's new EcoTank printers. With Epson's line of SuperTank all-in-one printers, you can print thousands of documents without running out of ink. EcoTank is loaded and ready to print when you are. Visit epson.com slash ecotank to find out more. And by Zipcar. Zipcar is the largest car sharing network in the world. To earn $25 in driving credit, visit joinzipcar.com slash twit. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the home theater geek and editor of avsforum.com. This week's guest geek is Marshall Long, an uh, acoustician of 45 years experience. Uh, hey, Marshall, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm glad, I'm glad to be here. I hope, I hope you, it's not... Uh, <laughs> wrong of me to say how much experience you have, but it, it's a very <laughs> impressive career you got there. I think all of the actual acousticians on the show uh, have uh, white beards, and uh, so. yes, yes, <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right about that. Yeah. Uh, so before we get started, let me just uh, remind everybody that those who are watching live at live.twit.tv can log into the chat room there, and uh, you can do that also at irc.twit.tv. And I'll uh, be monitoring the chat room, and you can post questions for Marshall as we go, and I'll pass along as many as I can. Uh, it helps if you put my screen name, which is my name, Scott Wilkinson, no dots or dashes, into your message, anywhere in your message. That way it shows up in a different color on my screen, and my eye gets drawn to it more readily. Now, Marshall, as I said, you've got 45 years of experience as an acoustician, uh, and yet you have agreed, and I thank you so much for this, to uh, f help us understand some of the real basic elements of acoustics and sound, uh, which is really important for understanding how to get the most out of a sound system, how to build a sound system, uh, all that kind of stuff. So uh, we're going to take a little detour into uh, Acoustics 101 here, and, and I thank you so much for agreeing to do that. Sure, it's my pleasure. I have to go through it myself. In fact, I uh, wrote down a bunch of the familiar equations and uh, <laughs> to try to, try to help me remember all this stuff. Right. Well, we're not going to go into equations. I want everybody on who's watching the show know that we're not going to get into math and all that stuff. Um, so don't don't run away screaming. You know, so many people get so turned off by mathematics, and I myself really enjoy it. But it, it is very scary for a lot of people. So we're not going to talk about that. We are going to, though, talk about uh, what sound is and how it works. And, and in that understanding, be able to understand how, how acoustics work. So let's start with waves, which is, after all, what sound is. Nothing but waves, right? Yeah, I, I also have a little... Uh, <clears throat> show and tell which i like to play around with and uh, just to um get us started uh, everything that has sound uh, in its name isn't necessarily um uh, effective there are products out there that call themselves sound this or sound that and i brought one of those uh, along <clears throat> um I, this as you might guess is a two by four Mm -hmm. And and uh, but it's someone wood, is, right? yeah someone has helpfully inscribed I gotta get it turned around sound on it <laughs> because, just so that people would know it's a special sound two by four <laughs> so and, and what, is, what is it supposed to do 
Well, I, I, I don't know, and I don't know why they inscribed it, but I presume it's to impress someone as to its effectiveness for sound. So, anyway. <laughs> well, well, we'll talk about how effective it could possibly be here. <laughs> I mean, but, you, uh, you sent, us a, sent me a graphic uh, that shows the different kinds of waves that there are in the world. Uh, let's take a look at that one, uh, number one. Uh, figure 2-16. We should point out that the all, most of these figures come from a book that you wrote uh, called Architectural Acoustics. And so we're going to call them sometimes by their figure number. Uh, so that's just why that is, because they come out of this book that, that you wrote, uh, what, 10, 15 years ago? Yeah, the first edition was about 15 years ago, and then a second edition came out after uh, 10 years. So um about five years ago and this um, book does have a lot of mathematics in it i will tell you this i've looked through it and it's a it's a upper level or graduate course textbook no question about it so we're going to look at some of the pictures out of there let's start with 2-16 and uh marshall tell us what we're looking at here well we're looking at um the shapes of various waves now th this doesn't represent all the types of waves but um, <clears throat> the, the top one is, uh, a, um, sound wave and, and it's a, called a, a longitudinal wave because the displacement is in the direction of the path, uh, of the sound. And, um, so what happens is that, um, in, in a fluid or a gas, then, um, well, a gas, the the sound um, uh, particles or, or the um, material particles are squished together when there's a high pressure and and uh, uh, pulled apart when there's a low pressure. And so you can see in the top there's this superimposer uh, of um, um, squished areas and uh, um, um, low pressure areas. Oh, well, I don't uh, know. This is, might be a kind of a small diagram, but if Victor can zoom in on the top one, uh, we we might be able to see that a little better. Yeah, uh, a sound a sound wave is kind of like uh, an accordion, uh, so it it gets pushed together and pulled apart, and also like a wave you might find uh, in a slinky, which is a, mm -hmm. a, a kid's toy. Um, but um, then the other the other ones down below. Uh, drop down to a flexural wave, which might be in a, a piece of uh, thin sheet metal or something. And um, so uh, essentially it deforms. And um, this is somewhat like a water wave, although a water wave is a little more complicated. Um, and um, then down below, um, there's a torsional wave, which is a twisting and then in B, there's a transverse shear wave. Shear wave is where um, the deflection is vertical. Um, and um, um, at right angles to the uh, propagation direction. Right. Whereas sound waves being longitudinal, the propagation direction, that is the direction the wave itself is moving, is in the same direction as the change in pressure or velocity, uh, the, the areas of the, high pressure and low pressure uh, move along this, the direction of the wave. Right, the displacement, <clears throat> that's right. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so... I'm gonna, I'm gonna disconnect my phone so it doesn't ring well. Oh, that's a good did, idea. Which it just did. <laughs> oh! <laughs> I always turn mine off. I should have told you to do that. I apologize. <laughs> um, okay, so so that's the physics of sound waves, uh, but re but m perhaps even more important is the human response to sound waves, right? We are human beings. We have ears. The sound comes into the ear, and we hear it, probably depending on the frequency and the amplitude, which which we're going to talk about next. Um, so we have, for example, the next figure, which is 3.09. And these are the famous curves that are often referred to as the Fletcher-Munson curves. But that's not how this diagram is labeled. Why is that? 
Well, these were taken a little later. That's that's all. Then they're they're just a little more accurate. Um, and you'll you'll notice on the left hand axis that's uh, measured in decibels or dB, mm-hmm. which is <clears throat> a logarithmic ratio of of pressure. So, or uh, or or pressure squared, and um, it's just a lot easier to talk in decibels because the range of pressures is so great that you'd have large numbers. So that's that's why we uh, we talk in terms of decibels. But but the human reaction to sound <clears throat> is uh, is measured just by giving people essentially a hearing test. Uh, and um, they did this, um, or, uh, the original tests were done in state fairs where they would just gather up uh, anybody that wanted to be tested and put them in a um, little room and, and um, play tones and see how they <clears throat> reacted to that and, and make curves out of that that depended on how loud it was and how what the frequency was and so you get a series of these curves that that uh, show how sensitive the ear is so when in other that, words these curves all basic are, are a conglomeration if you will or an average of the responses of a bunch of different people at state fairs i never knew that that's pretty <laughs> kind of the average person right the average joe uh, yeah, that's right. Going, well, sure, I'll go do that. Why not? Uh, and so what what are these curves telling us? Well, first they tell us that <clears throat> we don't hear all frequencies uh, equally. We're more sensitive to the higher frequencies and less sensitive to the lower frequencies. And um, and that also but that also depends on how loud the sound is. So as the sound gets louder, uh, the the uh, curves tend to flatten out. So uh, uh, we become more sensitive to the low frequency sounds. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then um, these curves can be used to build sound level meters. But we have to we have to simplify the, the curve the, the the jiggles in them. Mm-hmm. And so, well, for and example, so, for example, well, let's take a look at. Uh, I think what what I what I understand how I understand this curve to work. Uh, the each curve represents kind of a constant perceived volume, correct? That's right. That's right. Okay. They're and in so phones. A, they're in phones. A unit of measure but, called F PHON. It, yeah, but nobody. It's it's kind of cumbersome to use that. So we've gone. Mm-hmm. Uh, away from that a little bit. Mm. Right. So what these curves tell us really is that at the very lowest frequencies, which are to the left, on the left of the graph, uh, for someone to perceive a a low frequency sound as being a given volume, it actually has to have a much higher amplitude, a lot more amplitude in order for the ear to say, oh yeah, for the human rather, to say, okay, that's the, that's the loudness that we're, we're aiming for. And then as you get higher in frequency, that that amplitude drops. It gets less and less and less. And it's lowest at about, looks like uh, 4K maybe? Yeah, that's where the ear is is the most sensitive. And, and, there- and uh, interestingly, that's where the uh, hearing loss occurs most frequently. You and get, isn't, that, uh, isn't that ironic because 4K is also where the majority of speech intelligibility is. Yeah, uh, a, a, a lot of it is. In a that, lot of in it, that, not all of it, but a lot of in, it. In that range between 1 kilohertz and 3.5 kilohertz, something like that. But, uh, right. And so isn't yeah. that ironic that, that the, the, the first place to get damaged by hearing, by noise-induced hearing loss, or primarily, or age, uh, is right in the same place where you need to be able to understand what someone's saying to you. That, to me, always, I thought that was always very ironic. Yeah, I don't know whether anybody's looked into the history of how we we developed um, sensitivity to speech, but I would think 
you know that that that, that would, those would be linked. Uh, it's not my area of expertise, but uh, yeah, no, it's just it's just a side comment, really. Right. Um. So so there we have the 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 perception to sound, the human perception to sound, and here next up we want to talk a little bit about how sound is measured. And I, this is particularly interesting to me because I go in, whenever I go out to the movies, I will take my sound level meter with me and measure the levels in the movie because they're always too loud for me. So I want to I want to document that. I, do, I don't want to just walk out of the theater as a grumpy old man and say, ah, it's too loud. Uh, I want to say, look, it was this, it was this loud. Here's an objective, measurable uh, value, uh, and and we have values uh, that are often called reference level that theaters and home theaters and mixers, people who actually make soundtracks, they all want to conform to this reference level. Now that all requires a sound meter, some sort of a piece of equipment that actually measures sound, and there's different ways to do that too. So I want to touch on that a little bit here. Yeah, just just a plug. You can you can buy a very inexpensive um, sound meter program that works on a uh, iPhone, and uh, I don't know, it's twenty five dollars or something. And it's, that's in, it's, in fact what I, in fact what I use. Studio okay. Six, <laughs> Studio Six Digital uh, Audio Tools is what it's called. And yeah, that's with, one with, of them. They're, they're they're and they're remarkably good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially with a calibrated mic, which I. That's more expensive. You know, right. hardware is always more expensive. Well, almost always more expensive than software. So the software, you're right, was about 20 bucks, 30 bucks, something like that. But the calibrated microphone, that was a couple hundred bucks. <laughs> yeah, uh, and even it, if you don't use a, a calibrated microphone, I've checked it against my, my B&K meter, and it's usually within a couple dB. Oh, well, that's pretty good. And B&K, Brule and Kyer, I think is uh, what that yeah, stands Brule for. Brule and Kyer. Care, yeah, that that's a high end meter. That's now you're talking some serious money. <laughs> but we often talk when we when we measure sound, we often talk about it, sound is measured in decibels, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, but there is there are two different what are called weightings. Uh, there's A weighting and C weighting. There's also B weighting, but that's hardly ever used. And I'd love for you to explain what A weighting and B weighting is. Uh, C weighting, rather. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what once we had these um, um, state fair measured curves, it turned out that um, people wanted uh, to devise an electrical uh, filter, essentially that that uh, filtered like the ear filters, so that we could uh, attach a number to it that that was easier a uh, one number that is easier to understand. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether we can go back to the uh, um, the previous um, slide. Uh, sure, but, no problem. Okay. As as, there it is. So what happened was that they decided to use the 40 phone curve as one standard. And it's, it's um, about, oh, I don't know, a quarter of the way up from the bottom. And um, so... You see, it's got a lot of bumps and, and stuff in it. So what they did, and then if we go back to the previous uh, slide where it has um, uh, A, B, and C, or the next well, slide. That's actually the next one, 311. Yeah. So what they did was that they drew a smooth curve through the 40 phone line. And and this is just, it's, it's the 40 phone line smooth and turned upside down. So that's the um, the filter essentially that the ear presents at um, a moderately low level, which is forty phones. Mm -hmm. Then, as you uh, and that increase, correspond, that by the way, that corresponds to a weighting. Right, exactly. It's got a little a beside it, and then um, as you get louder. Then the ear tends to flatten out, so they had a B weighting curve that's a little bit higher, and a little um, uh, less sensitive to low frequencies. And then finally, 
a C weighting, which is the, I believe it's the 80 phone curve. I think the B is the 60 phone curve. And the um, C weighting is pretty flat. So um, the B weighting is not really used very much, uh, but the A and C continue to be used. Mm -hmm. And um, so um, it's just interesting how they, how they were developed. You know, I've spent a lot of time measuring sound levels in theaters, at concerts, and places like that, and generally places where the sound level is overall relatively high. And thereby hangs a, a dilemma for me, which is the, the standard way of measuring a reference level in theaters, in recording studios, in homes, is to use the DBA curve, uh, which really discounts a lot of the low frequency information. Uh, and so I decided some time ago, well, you know what? I'm going to measure in C because it's closer to flat. It's loud. C is more related to loud sounds than, than A is because it's on the 80 phone curve rather than the 40 phone curve. And, uh, and so I've done that for a long time. Uh, but really, my goal is to make sure that people are aware of what kind of levels they're being exposed to in order to make conscious choices about how they want to protect their hearing. Uh, so I've come. And so that's why another reason I use C, because I thought, well, C incorporates or includes is sensitive to more more low frequency information. And that's got to have also a, a negative impact on hearing. Um, but then I, I spoke to our mutual friend, uh, Warren Line, who's a, a ear, nose, throat doctor, otolaryngologist, and I asked him if, uh, if C weighting was, was what I should use. Do low, in other words, do low frequencies have as much impact on hearing damage? And he said, no, they don't. And so that may be why they use A. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's more convenient for um um, sources that don't have a lot of low frequency content. Yeah, now, well, but, another, but, 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 but movies do. <laughs> well, particularly Mo movies have trailer, a lot of Yeah, it's particularly trailers, and, and that's been um, a subject of much uh, discussion at uh, SMPTE and, and some of the other organizations that uh, uh, have a say in, in how loud movies are because um the the trailers are always a few db louder than the film and uh so that that, that that's my one of my public peeves <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well i normally i normally measure the entire experience including the trailers and i think maybe the next time i go i might measure the trailers separately from measuring the movie and see what kind of difference i get the bottom line for me is that I started, I, I decided recently to change to A because of what Dr. Line said, that low frequencies don't contribute very much to uh, hearing loss. And because that's what other people use to determine the reference level that's in a theater or in a studio or in a home. Um, and here we see again the A, B, and C curves. And so when you read my reviews of movies out in the theaters, uh, which I write regularly, uh, I will have, I will, I'm now switching to A weighting uh, for those reasons. And I, I just wanted everybody to understand the the difference between those two, because I, I, I specify I'm measuring in DBA or DBC or something like that. And uh, a lot of people kind of scratch their heads and go, what? <laughs> yeah. And, and an, another one of my peeves is loud restaurants. And so mm. I, uh, I enjoy going to a, a restaurant with my wife where I can actually, we can have a conversation. And uh, what's interesting is, is, is some of the restaurant critics uh, in their reviews are listing the l noise level in these restaurants, which I think is very helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, we got a lot more to talk about, but before we do, I'd like to take a moment to thank one of our sponsors for this episode, which is Epson. Epson's revolutionary, cartridge-free EcoTank line of printers for home and office introduce a new age in printing. The EcoTank ET4550 wireless all-in-one printer doesn't use ink cartridges. 
Instead, it features an amazing, innovative, refillable ink tank, earning it the title of CES 2016 Innovation Awards honoree. So you'll have no more out of ink frustration. It includes up to two years of ink, equal to about 11,000 black pages or 8,500 color pages right there in the box. You can save up to 80% on ink with low cost replacement ink bottles. It's also powered by precision core printing technology. It also has auto two-sided printing and a 30 page auto document feeder and easy wireless printing from tablets and smartphones. All Ecotank printers deliver an unbeatable combination of convenience and value. With Epson's Ecotank line of printers, you'll have the freedom to print without running out of ink. The Epson Ecotank system, in fact, was named the 2016 Small Biz Windows Printer of the Year. So visit epson.com slash ecotank today to transform the way your office, home, or work group prints. For the best combination of ease and value, turn to the Epson Ecotank printers. That's epson.com slash ecotank. And we thank Epson very much for their support of home theater geeks. Epson, exceed your vision. So we've been taking a little stroll down the very basic aspects of sound with Marshall Long, acoustician of decades of experience. And uh, next, I'd like to uh, turn our attention to something that we find sometimes in um, uh, large concert venues, which you've worked on for many, uh, which are called line arrays of speakers. This really connects the hearing, the sound waves, how we hear sound, to how sound is produced or reproduced, I should say, uh, by speakers. So uh, let's take a little look at uh, at what's going on there. Okay, <clears throat> um, line arrays, um, uh, as most of these uh, um, speaker arrangements ha ha have been around for a long time. Um, a guy named Olson back in the 50s wrote a great book and because he did a number of uh, measurements, but this is a good example of how sound waves interact with each other. And uh, what what the drawing shows is essentially a vertical um, uh, line of of um, sound sources, um, loudspeakers usually, which are those dots and, that are in that right, picture, the, the, the black dots. <clears throat> and then uh, the receiver is out to the right someplace, and so the, the receiver, uh, the receiver being people, a person, yes, or a microphone. Okay. And and um, so um, what happens is that um, if you move away from a, a line of these sources along um, what uh, would be the x-axis or the lower uh, flat uh, horizontal line. Mm -hmm. You you receive most of these if you're far enough away that uh, that you you receive signals more or less at the same time from this vertical line. Um, but as you um, change that uh, angle between um, the receiver and uh, the main uh, axis, uh, which is perpendicular to the line. Then there are there are differences in the the propagation distance between the sources, and since there are these differences in distance, um, the sound signals are displaced um, in in time uh, through right. the doesn't speed it, of doesn't sound. That, doesn't that mean that they that the sound from each of these speakers arrives at a different time at your ear or the microphone? That's right, and mm -hmm. and thus the, the 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 waves from each of these different sources interferes in um, more or less with the adjacent um, um, sound uh, emanations, and and so what we get is some cancellation, and the farther off axis we get, 
the more cancellation um, uh, is uh, experienced. Um, so um, that's um, the kind of the basic premises of the line array. But why, and, so uh, why is the, why is the line array so popular? And by line array, we're talking about basically a vertical stack of speakers. Uh, yeah, and you although. Yeah, te technically it doesn't have to be vertical, but that's uh, a uh, the most common configuration that you see. Okay. And, and when uh, you go to a when you go to a concert, you'll see that you'll see a long stack of speakers either suspended from the ceiling or sitting on either side of the stage. So why do we use that? Why is that so common? If uh, the the arrival time from each of those is a little different, and you get some interference problems. What's what's the advantage? Well, you get the kind of interference that you want. Um, you, you, you so a lot of times you want to control the vertical, what we call directivity, which is the change in level with direction of a speaker, and so um, because of that. Um, then um, this is a helpful feature uh, in, in many cases. So um, in a, a large concert venue, we may not want to send um, our sounds um, certainly vertically. We want to send it more towards the audience. Mm, so, that makes sense. So, um, you know, if we have some control, some vertical control, control over where the, the energy goes, then it's it's much more helpful. Um, so, the, the, and, and I think the next slide um, actually goes back to some work that Olson did in the 50s, and it, and it shows um, the effect, effectiveness of, um, of uh, the, what's called the directivity um, uh, on... Uh, a uh, a line of of speakers. Now, at the uh, th this is a lot of information, so we'll start at the top. And before we is, do, let me just let me just say that what what each of these graphs is depicting is the sound radiation pattern looking down from above a vertical line array of speakers. So we're basically floating on top of a of an array of speakers that are vertical and we're looking straight down, right? Yes, that's, that's right. And at, if you get low enough in frequency, then, then the wavelength is so long that the differences in, in phase are, are a small. So you end up with a nearly spherical pattern. And as you go up in frequency, so we're, we're hopscotching from starting on the upper left and then moving over to the right and then going, I think that's the way this is drawn. Yeah. No, I, I, are you sure? I think it's straight down the left side and then 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 you go back to the right oh, side. Oh, you, you're right. My, mine's cut off. So, uh, um, no, that's correct. Um, so, yeah, it goes, it goes straight down. So as we get um, uh, higher and higher in frequency, then this interference pattern becomes more prevalent. So if, if we could look uh, farther down uh, the page, then we can see that these directivity patterns, particularly when the length of the stack of sources um, is at least a wavelength high, um, then um, you know we get quite narrow patterns. Now the, 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 these are uh, vertical patterns, so you you're um, um, not necessarily horizontal patterns, even though we are looking um, along a line of of speakers. Yeah, that that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. We're looking down at at a line of speakers, and yet this pattern that we're seeing, the dispersion pattern, if you will, uh, is is uh, is a vertical dispersion pattern? Yeah, yeah. I actually, I think we're probably looking horizontally. All uh, right. I made a mistake then. My apologies. No, I, 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 in our earlier conversations, I uh, I steered you wrong. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this uh, is the this is the vertical 
the vertical dispersion pattern. So at a low frequency, of course, it's going to go everywhere. And as you get higher and higher and higher, it, it gets more and more directional. Yes, and it's only vertical because we are stacking our sources up in our drawing. So, you know, it could be... Um, so anyway, that's uh, what what it what it tells us is that our that our line in the line array has got to be at least a wavelength long before we get a, a lot of control, and and uh, you know in the in the lower right hand corner where you get up to uh, two wavelengths or four wavelengths and it, and it becomes uh, much more effective. So there's a a range uh, around a wavelength where um, these line arrays um, are uh, well behaved, but not so narrow that that they uh, uh, you know don't illuminate the whole audience. Mm -hmm. So and, and so that re and and then what what I have in the next picture, if we can go to that. Yeah, the next one is 1805. Yeah. We have and, to zoom and, back out. There we go. Right. Now, Here's a picture is, of a line array. This is a, a commercial only available line array that a company called L Acoustics in France uh, developed. In, in fact, the guy who uh, invented it, uh, Christian Heil, is um, um, one of the real pioneers in this area. And so what they've done is that they've used different kinds of of um, sources. Um, so up at the top, there's uh, the words low, mid, and high, and then little arrows that point down. And there's a center strip, a vertical strip, that's labeled high. That's right in the middle. Right. And that's the high-frequency radiators. And, the, the, and that's driven by um, a um, sort of a specially constructed series of pipes essentially and and uh, that so that all the sound that enters that uh, comes out at the same time um, in the high frequency uh, radiator and then as the mid frequency we we switch over to um, a series of um, uh, mid frequency drivers and and uh, um, these are these are essentially in uh, multiples of seven inches or so or whatever the European equivalent is and um, and so um, then it would be good for a certain uh, lower frequency uh, level and then finally we switch over to the low frequency and there we have to stack cabinets up to get the line source and uh, and the um, um, to be a, 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 at least a wavelength long, so um, this is a very clever way of uh, getting one very high power to very good directional control, which ends up yielding good feedback control um, because if you're a musician standing at the bottom of a 32-foot high stack of speakers, then you, you don't get as much energy as the people that are out uh, in line with the um, with the axis. Mm. So uh, it's it's a very um, a clever um, uh, use of acoustical engineering. Yeah. Now so, I wanted to ask I wanted to ask you this question. Uh, you, we, when we looked at the polar radiation patterns earlier, uh, which uh, basically the low frequencies were spherical, and, the, and as you got higher and higher frequencies, they became more directional. Isn't that generally true, even of a single speaker? Yes, but you see, a single speaker is, it only has one dimension. It's got a diameter, and and so <clears throat> um, uh, it's it has a range that. Uh, uh, it has a directivity uh, over. So the small speakers um, are usually omnidirectional, and then uh, it becomes more directional uh, as we um, uh, get at higher frequencies. So um, that's why we use um, a horn uh, in order to control 
um, the directional uh, characteristics of, of mm -hmm. the driver. Mm -hmm. So anyway, this is just another way of uh, using it, and, and there's a kind of a horn-like device at the high frequency. Mm -hmm. uh, Dale Poco in the chat room is asking, what about planar speakers? Do you have any experience with those? That is large, large sheets, vibrating sheets, electrostatic or, mag or planar magnetic speakers. Uh, I haven't a lot of experience with them, although um, they've been around for some time. And uh, the, the way I think they do uh, the directionality is by controlling the signal that they feed. Some of these have a mesh screen that, that uh, uh, helps um, control it by, by controlling um, the signal that's sent to an area of the speaker. Um, but um, uh, they also, I mean, uh, they're uh, really nice sounding. Um, they have a, a couple of uh, disadvantages. One is they usually radiate as much out the back as they do out the front. Right. Um, and uh, so if you're doing a home theater with, with planar arrays, um, then sometimes you have to put, absorptive material on the walls behind the speakers uh, as well as on the side mm -hmm. and so uh, but but they have a and, and also the the other problem you run into those is that often they need uh, additional subwoofers but but they, because they because they don't do low frequencies very well right but they sound wonderful <laughs> yeah yeah I've, I've heard plenty of them and they they really do sound wonderful well, speaking of directivity, uh, there was there's something you and I talked about before this show that I thought was really interesting, and that is the idea of a directional subwoofer. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, you know, that's that, kind of amazing because, as I mentioned a little earlier, low frequencies typically tend to radiate out in all directions, and that's the common wisdom when you put a subwoofer in a home theater is you can almost sort of put it anywhere. Now, that's not really true, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, but the idea of a directional subwoofer is really interesting to me, and you had something to say about it. Yeah, this has been a fairly recent development. I mean, it's probably within the last um, 10 years or so. And um, I don't uh, remember who developed it, but um, uh, um, he published a paper in it, and it made the rounds. And uh, it's quite clever. So um, um, if we can show the next slide, this is a little complicated, but essentially the main subwoofers are pointed down the page and they have the plus signs on them. So they're uh, in, in positive polarity with respect to the rear subwoofer. So what happens is that in front of the uh, cabinets, you get a sine wave, and and uh, that's the upper curve on the bottom. So if we go back to the bottom, um, if we can pan down. So um, the main uh, signal from the subwoofers going out the front is this sine wave that's the upper curve on the bottom. And then what happens is that they have a uh, another a uh, subwoofer that points to the rear but has the opposite polarity of the uh, ones in front. Now, part of that signal travels around to the front and and um, and they they configure these so that you have about a, a 3, B, 3 dB loss in level from the rear subwoofer to the front and about uh, and a certain uh, delay um, time. And so they end up delaying the, 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 the front signal coming out of the two subwoofers by that delay time. And then so that the natural delay that comes out of the back is in phase. So, so the stuff coming out the front, uh, is, uh, reinforced by the stuff going in the back at least. Um, and then, in the opposite direction to the rear, um, 
uh, the the um, signals are out of phase, and so they tend to cancel. And right. uh, so you don't you don't have a lot of sound. Be you end up not having a lot of sound behind the subwoofer, but you do have more sound in front of the subwoofer. Um, that's right. Now you have to be careful with anything that is phase dependent, because when if it bounces off of something, then the phase relationship may change because uh, the physical um, uh, arrangement changes. So, you, so um, you 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 can't expect miracles out of anything. So yeah, right. <laughs> but again, this is a clever use of uh, of. Um, these these uh, uh, speakers and and delays. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's that that's a pretty cool idea. I want. Do you know if anyone's ever made a product using this idea? I think so, but I don't know. I couldn't give you a name. And mm. um, I'm 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 not. Usually, it's it's most helpful in outdoor venues because of the uh, reflections. I'm not sure it would be all that ah. great in, inside a room. Because mm -hmm. stuff's bouncing all over them. Right. Okay. All right. Well, next up, we're going to talk about rooms. And and this is a really important aspect of things because all of us uh, have, well, many of us have home theaters in, our, in rooms. And we want to understand what's going on with sound in a room. But before we do, <laughs> let me take this moment to thank our other sponsor for this episode, which is Zipcar. Now, Zipcar is the world's largest car sharing network, operating in over 500 cities, towns, colleges, and more than 50 airports around the world. Zipcar provides a cost-effective alternative to car ownership. Zipsters only pay for the time they actually use a vehicle and have no responsibility for additional costs. You can drive cars by the hour or by the day with gas and insurance included. With Zipcar, you'll have the freedom to choose when and where you want to drive. Zipcar's self-service vehicles are available on demand in conveniently located reserved parking spots in your neighborhood. Reserve your Zipcar in minutes, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, by calling or visiting the website. Simply book the vehicle of your choosing and unlock your selected vehicle with your Zipcard. Zipcar offers over 50 makes and models of cars that range from environmentally friendly hybrids, EVs, and PHEVs to luxury vehicles, SUVs, pickup trucks, and cargo vans. You'll have the option to choose the make, model, type, and even color of the vehicle you want based on the needs of each trip and the available Zipcars in your area. Reserving, accessing, and using a Zipcar is as easy as getting cash from an ATM. And car sharing is good for the environment. Zipsters reduce their personal CO2 emissions by between 1,100 and 1,600 pounds per year. For wheels when you want them and $25 in driving credit, go to joinzipcar.com slash twit. That's joinzipcar.com slash twit. And we thank Zipcar very much for their support of Home Theater Geeks. So now we get to the bread and butter, if you will, of, uh, of home theater geekery. And that is rooms. We all have our theaters in rooms, except for those of us who have a theater outdoors. And you've done a lot of outdoor spaces, too, but... We don't have time for that this trip. Maybe we'll have you back and talk about that another time. Let's talk about small rooms. And really the problem in small rooms, the main problem, is... Yeah, and, and, and also the main difference between the design of small rooms and large rooms is that you <clears throat> have... Uh, boundaries in a small room which are close enough together that they um, uh, contribute to the formation of uh, what are called standing waves. And, um, and then those uh, f w w turn out to be at high enough frequency that we can hear them. And so uh, Stand standing, standing waves do occur in large rooms, but they're so low that no one can hear them. Well, uh, that's right. And, and so um, what 
a, a standing way. I, I think we have a um, a slide on this, and so yeah, eight oh one, eight point one, right? Now, what what um, happens in a room uh, or a tube with a cap on the end? On both ends, right? On each end. If we can take right. a look at uh, at no, at number eight point oh one. There it is. Okay. So each of these ends um, is is covered. And what we're plotting uh, on the left-hand side is uh, the square of the pressure because that's what we end up hearing. And so um, as uh, a wave approaches um, the boundary, um, then uh, it's, it's, it's pressure – uh, goes up because it it, it, it encounters uh, the boundary, and the then, wall. In the, in the case of a room, the wall, the ceiling, the floor. Uh, right. We're looking at a picture of a tube here, but that's just representing a room. That's right. And then um, when there is a um, um, a frequency which is um, whose wavelength is twice the length of the of the room uh, in, uh, you know, whatever direction um, you're, uh, let's, let's go down um, on the slide a little bit. Mm -hmm. Can, can you move the slide down? We're, we're already yeah. down at the bottom of this particular slide. Okay. Uh, sorry. Up. <laughs> oh, my, up. My sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. You got it there. And um, so at the other end, the same thing happens. So we get pressure maxima uh, at the boundaries. Um, now in the middle, um, we have because it's a, it's a square of the wave. So so both of the amplitudes on this graph are positive. Um, then in the middle, we have um, a, a, a node or a minimum in in the in the pressure squared. What's sometimes yeah. called the null, right? Or in the in the vernacular, uh, you get uh, base suck out, right? Which, uh, which used to be um, a dreaded uh, 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 component of um, mixing rooms. Um, right. So people would make um, ceilings which were dipped. Uh, down in the middle to increase the pressure in those areas and all sorts of techniques that they tried mm -hmm. to do. Let's make sure, but, let me make, before you go on, let me make sure everybody understands that what we're talking about here is the relationship between the wavelength of a, of a frequency, of a sound, and the distance between walls in a room. So the lowest frequency that we can hear is 20 hertz, and I believe that wavelength is about 55 feet. Have I got that right? I don't know. I, I have my cal calculator, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty. Sh I'm pretty sure that's kind of near <laughs> near the mark. And so basically, we're talking about half wavelengths here. So the lowest frequency, 20 hertz. Uh, if that's if that wavelength is 55 feet, call it 50 just for ease. Then if you have a room and it's got one of its dimensions is 25 feet, then you're going to get a standing wave at that low frequency, at that 20 hertz. But anything that you hear is going to be in a narrower room uh, because you, you it's going to be at a higher frequency. And, um, and then as you so get higher, yeah, as you get higher, the, the wavelength decreases, gets smaller. And so if you have a dimension in your room, either the length or the width or the height, which is, say, 20 feet or 15 feet or, uh, or so, that, those are kind of common room dimensions, uh, then you're going to get these standing waves in the, where you have a wavelength of uh, 30 feet or 40 feet, which is still pretty low. But if you're sitting in the middle of that room in that direction, in that dimension, you're not going to hear that frequency. It's going to be it's going to be quote unquote sucked out. Yes, and the thing to remember is um, if you if you talk about the tube, 
um, people have asked me, well, what happens to the other sounds, to what, the other frequencies? Yeah. Well, what, hap what ha happens is that they rattle around and um, they uh, are at um, all frequencies, say, so they tend to cancel each other out. The only ones that persist are the ones that have this uh, relationship to the dimension of the room, which is stable. And so yeah, the room's not changing its dimension, so that's it. Right. So as you and and these are um, in in rectangular rooms in, in relatively fixed positions, so you can walk around the room and walk in and out of these nulls, and and uh, uh, you may only change your position by a few feet, and um, you know it makes a large difference. Right, because different frequencies have different wavelengths and they interact differently or they create nulls in different locations within the room. So the, the overall tonal characteristic or timbral characteristic of a, of a sound, say a complex sound, not just a sine wave, uh, in one place in the room, the low, some low frequency will be non-existent. In another place in the room, some mid-frequency may be non-existent or mid-low frequency. Uh, so the tonal characteristic changes as you move around in the room, except at the boundary. If you're sitting right up against the wall, all of those pressure gradients are maximized at the wall, right? That's right. And, and um, um, uh, Floyd Toole did an interesting book where he... Uh, cited some research that he had done uh, using, and he developed techniques uh, through the positioning of subwoofers um, at uh, or close to the nulls. Now, you can't put them in the middle of the room usually, but you can put them along uh, a wall um, so that it uh, matches a null in in one particular mode um so you might have to have oh two subwoofers and you have, may have to move them around in the, in the room in order to get a uh, uh an even uh, base coverage so um um and his book is is very interesting in, in that on that subject and others mm -hmm. We have another picture of standing of a standing wave in a room, and that's 8.07. And this is more like a real room. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, now, this is done uh, by the uh, um, meter uh, manufacturer, Berlin Care. And they had, uh, they may still have, I don't know, they had a very nice um, um, published um, articles in, in a uh, little books that they would make. And, and this is taken from one of those. And in the top um, drawing, um, there are essentially uh, four um, modes. Um, in, well, four in, nulls. Well, both. I mean, oh. well, yeah, four, four nulls, but, but you know, you get half a mode for each null. So, mm, yeah. uh, um, so anyway, um, uh, it's easier to count the nulls, um, but the modes are, are there, although, you know, there's only half of them, uh, one on one end of the room and the other on the other end of the room where the pressure maximum occurs. So, um, and then in the bottom um, uh, graph, um, it it gets a, a, a little more complicated because we have um, modes in two dimensions, and so um, and you get uh, interesting uh, patterns there. But um, so this this kind of gives you an idea of how um, the room affects um, these the sound behavior. Um, and and so um, um, Floyd's book is is illustrative and and gives some interesting techniques that might be helpful in home theaters, um, 
where uh, most um, or many um, uh, sound systems usually use the base uh, subwoofers right up against the wall. And that um, is very good at exciting uh, certain modes, but uh, um, you may or may not want those modes. Mm -hmm. And so finally we come to uh, how to improve the performance, the sonic or aural performance of a room uh, with the use of acoustic treatments. And uh, I know you've got a lot of experience with that as well. Yeah, we don't have a lot of slides on that, but essentially, um, if you go into a, um, a, a theater that shows uh, movies, um, then normally those are designed to be very dead because first it's a fairly large room. And so uh, you'll find that most of the walls are covered with a, an absorptive panel Usually they are a cloth-covered uh, panel that has a fiberglass board um, one or two inches thick. And, um, and then the, the ceilings will be a, a blackened um, um, acoustical tile, uh, with, uh, often with bad insulation above it for extra ins uh, absorption. So, uh, and then of course the, the seats themselves will be heavily padded. So, although uh, the, although there are people in those seats, hopefully, <laughs> if the theater well, has anything to say about it, but people yeah, are but, relatively padded as well, aren't they? <laughs> well, I am, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, yes, that's um, um, uh, because the movie uh, makers want you to hear. Uh, the product that best represents how they um, um, intended uh, their their film to be seen. So, uh, and, and sound being a great part of that, um, uh, they don't want the odd uh, reflection uh, to interfere with the experience. So, uh, with, with home theaters, um, you have some of that, but often the home theaters are also listening rooms. So they, they, they may want to uh, um, work uh, around these um, different requirements. So uh, with, uh, you, you, if you're uh, listening to a home um, stereo system, then you may want a little more liveness in the room than you would for a purely um, uh, Film experience, um, well, and I wonder. I often I guess I don't use film is. anymore, but <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. People often talk about film. I have often wondered, and I know many people also have often wondered: uh, Is it possible to make a room that is ideally suited for both movies and what audiophiles do to channel music? Playback, and from what you're saying, it sounds like the answer may be no. Well, uh, sort of no. I mean, I think the differences are small. Um, in the listening rooms that I've done, then usually it's a personal taste thing, where the the room owner w may want a little liveness in in the uh, um, in the stereo music. Um, experience and uh, so um, there what you have to be careful about is you want that the um, uh, first reflection point between the source and uh, the listener so, so wherever that sound would bounce off a wall that would be the or ceiling or whatever hard surface that reflection point should should be treated either an absorber or a, a diffuser. And a diffuser is usually a, a, a bumpy or um, um, maybe semi-cylindrical uh, cylindric, shape that sends sound, incident sounds off in different directions. Mm -hmm. so, so it doesn't end up... Um, you know, coming back to the listener and um, and uh, and and interfering 
with that experience. Now, what now, we're looking the, at here is a Schroeder diffuser, right? A particular type of diffuser, and 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 uh, I just sent that up to uh, the uh, engineer to talk, to show us here because that's a kind of a special case. Well, it's a case of a, a open closed tube, each of the slots, and and, and it's only. Um, um, it only diffuses along the axis uh, um, that are is perpendicular to the line of the slots, and so um, the uh, what happens there is that the way they work is that uh, first of all each slot is an open closed tube, so there's a resonant frequency associated with that the the which is the 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 depth is the quarter wavelength of the of the uh, sound that uh, is gets resonated. Yeah, it's resonated, and so sound comes along and enters that that tube essentially, and it um, then uh, bounces back and forth. Some of it radiates back out of the open side, and some of it returns uh, to the uh, bottom of the tube to, um, you know, uh, have another cycle. And so the stuff that comes out the end, that end has to be small with compare, the opening has to be small compared to a wavelength. So it becomes essentially uh, um, uh, omnidirectional uh, um, uh, diffuser, right? Source. Well, source. Oh, I see. I got you. And, and, and so um and that's why they they have different depths because they are uh, essentially trying to cover a, a range of frequencies, mm -hmm. um, and then so um, that energy comes back out of the tube at a later time. So um, it it um, it diffuses out, um, um, but it all the, the the shorter diffusers are. Um, uh, useful, and but they also you have to remember they also um, uh, absorb sound, and um, they also have a um, a, a somewhat limited um, um, frequency range. Mm -hmm. You mentioned one last thing. We're almost out of time here, but I wanted to just touch upon something that the gem doctor in the chat room is talking about, which is being in a totally dead room is just plain creepy. And I've been in a, an, what are called anechoic chambers, which really have no reflection whatsoever. And it is creepy. It's very strange. Uh, and so you said earlier that uh, in a movie theater, you wanted a pretty dead room because the movie producers wanted the sound to come at you the way they envisioned it. But it can't be a completely dead room, can it? Well, no, uh, uh, it's physically uh, not really practical um, because, uh, as you say, in an anechoic chamber, you have uh, fiberglass wedges that are five, uh, six, or six feet long. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's in the, the, the in the floor as well as the walls and ceiling. <laughs> right. Exactly. But you got to remember that that there's a lot of folks in these rooms and. Uh, uh, you know they're chattering and um, um, and so at least um, you don't get the sense that um, a, a f commercial theater uh, uh, film theater um, is creepy uh, unless the movie's creepy <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but not in terms of the deadness of it it's not that dead right but as as I said um, you know, um, listening room design is is very personal, and uh, some people um, um, like it dead. Some people don't. So uh, you know, it's just it's just a matter of, uh, um, and and there, I mean, we have a picture on the, our website of some some studios, and we have. Uh, studios that have variable uh, acoustics where you'll take, um, you know, you'll have a wall that has um, maybe a two-by-two two pad on it with, uh, that are hung from eyelets, and you can take them down or you can 
fold them up or, you know, change the... Change uh, the acoustics. Right. So, yeah. Well, listen, uh, it, we've come to the end of a fascinating hour. I want to thank you so much for being here and helping uh, us to understand some of the basics of sound and of standing waves. And, and uh, there's a lot more to talk about, I'm sure. I mean, your book is, what, six, seven hundred pages long? <laughs> Almost a thousand. <laughs> a thousand pages long. <laughs> and you've got so many interesting projects that you've worked on. Uh, perhaps you can come back and tell us about some of those, okay? Yeah, I'd love to do that, and I appreciate your having me. It's um, it's a real compliment. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> that's Marshall Long, acoustician. Uh, he, his website is mlacoustics.com, and for more information about what he does, uh, by all means, visit there. Uh, you can always find me at avsforum.com. You can email me at scott at twit.tv, and you can follow me on Twitter at HTGeekScott and at AVS Forum. And you can always find previous episodes of Home Theater Geeks right here at twit.tv slash HTG and on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash twit home theater geeks. Next week, I'll be at the Cedia Trade Show in lovely Dallas, Texas. And this show, which is being recorded ahead of time, will play at our normally scheduled time then. But the following week, uh, September 22nd, I will be back live with a panel of journalists who were at CEDIA with me uh, to talk about everything we saw and heard at the show, or will have seen and heard at the show, to be grammatically correct. Uh, and it, uh, I know for a fact that there's going to be lots of really cool, interesting stuff there. So I do hope you will join us for that. Until then, geek out. Geek out.